I, I think that uh, you know, what I'm going to talk about has, as I mentioned earlier, been of great interest to me for many, many years. And uh, as I see it, it is the most significant physical event that has happened to our planet since the end of the last ice age, and that's the opening of the Arctic. Um, it, it is interesting because it, it changes many things. It opens up resources, and many people think that it's all about energy, oil and gas in the high north. But it changes shipping patterns uh, around the world. When you open up sea routes uh, in the north, it can fundamentally change shipping times. Uh, it has significant human implications because people, societies who have been living a, a way of life for millennia based on subsistence whaling and fishing, that way of life is gone. It will go away. And so what is the human impact of this? And then the part that we're working on at Hoover that has allowed me to continue uh, this work that I enjoy is really on the security dimension of the Arctic. And a lot of people say, well, it's all about the military and it's about the militarization of the Arctic. And I'm very clear to the folks that I've been working with that it's not about militarizing the Arctic. It's about what do we, meaning the global community, have to do to create a safe, secure, and prosperous Arctic and to do it responsibly. Um, as I said, the Arctic is opening. For Navy people, you get all excited when a new ocean appears in the world. Um, and some have said, well, the Arctic is just like the Antarctic, only it's in the north. But it really isn't, because the Arctic is an ocean surrounded by land. The Antarctic is land surrounded by ocean. So the problems are different, the environment is different. And just to give you a sense of what the change is that is taking place, I have a little video clip. And I ask that you look at two things. There's a little time tick that goes across the bottom. Um, and you'll be able to see the years and the months. And then you'll see this quivering mass of jello, which is the summer ice of the Arctic Ocean. And I ask that you just look at that time tick, look at how the physical change is taking place, and pay particular attention when it starts to get around 2002. So if we could see the clip. Thank you. So you see it's pretty dramatic right toward the end. Uh, and the sense is that there's a current in the Beaufort Sea that broke down. And that's what caused that flushing of a lot of that ice out. Now you possibly saw in the paper today that this year there was 30% more ice than there was last year. But that's all new ice. What has gone away is the multi-year ice, uh, the big thick ice. Now. Um, even though it was the least iced Arctic in history last year, uh, it was also the stormiest Arctic in history. So even when the ice goes away, it's still going to be a bad place. It's still going to be a hard place in which to live and operate. Um, and the other thing about ice, it's kind of like politics. It's all local. So even though you saw the breakdown over the entire Arctic Ocean, uh, the ice along the Canadian shore uh, is going to be localized, heavy, and unpredictable. So it's still going to be a, a tough place to be. I mentioned the four areas that we were looking at. 
Um, one is in the area of what I call resources. Um, I really think that we're probably not going to see, at least for the U.S. Arctic, uh, to see energy coming out in the way that we assumed it would be a few years ago. Largely driven by uh, the advances in fracking and horizontal drilling in the lower 48. And then uh, the other thing that I'm looking at also is the changes uh, to the petroleum laws in Mexico, which will open up significant oil fields in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, it will be less costly to pull the oil and, and gas out of those areas than it is out of the Arctic. That has implications for the state of Alaska because of all the revenue that's derived uh, from the energy industry up there. I still think that you're going to see significant energy extraction in, on the Russian side because that's where they base um, their economy on or what they base their economy on. So still to be determined. The other part that is not given a lot of uh, attention are the mineral deposits that exist in the Arctic. Huge amounts of iron, uh, of iron ore, of copper, of zinc. Uh, significant mines that are up there. The Chinese have just made a huge investment in Greenland and an iron ore mine up there in the billions of dollars. Um, and so I think what we'll see first on the resource side is significant uh, mineral extraction coming out of there. With regard to shipping, um, you know, there, the, the sea routes that open, the, the Northwest Passage, which goes along Canada, Northern Sea Route, which goes along Russia, and then something that's referred to as the transpolar route that goes right over the top and over the North Pole. Those are the sea routes that will open. Um, as I said, I think the Northwest Passage will have some icy issues as we go forward. But then you have to look at what is the type of shipping that's going to be in play up there. Um, the first that I think we'll see in large number is actually tourism. And I happened to see a photograph of a large cruise ship, probably about 2,000 passengers, threading its way through icebergs north of Greenland. And I saw that photograph about the time that the Costa Concordia, that liner in the Mediterranean that hit a rock and sank off the coast of Italy, when people could just jump off in the warmer water and swim ashore. The Arctic is not going to be like that. And so the challenge that you have is what happens if you have a maritime disaster up there. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the infrastructure associated with that. Uh, so I think that's going to happen. Uh, the exploration and the resource extraction shipping that will take place. How do you make sure it's being done responsibly? How do you prepare for an environmental incident or an environmental disaster? Uh, that's something that needs to be taken into account. Destination shipping, the shipping that will come from ports around the world and go largely to where the mineral deposits are uh, and then bring that out. So I think that is going to be uh, a significant amount of the shipping that will take place. There are many, and quite frankly, when we started our work at Hoover, um, we had visions of the Arctic, and I've harbored these beliefs for quite some time, of uh, the container traffic really jumping on the northern routes uh, because you can make the transit in a much shorter period of time between Asia and Europe by going north than you can all the way around under ideal conditions. But as we looked at it, when you analyze container shipping and what's in the containers that are moving around, a vast amount of that uh, stuff in the container is really components. They're parts of a manufacturing process, parts of a supply chain that depend on very precise delivery times. In fact, the container industry uh, bases its business model on high percentage, like 98, 98% delivery within hours at a particular port. The uncertainties of uh, the shipping routes in the Arctic, we think, will inhibit that container traffic uh, from using that as a preferred route. Similarly, because half of the time it's going to be dark and icy and stormy, um, it's going to be much harder to operate up there. So. Uh, probably not the case. And then when you look at how the container industry looks at cost, it's cost per container. 
So if they're building the mega container ships, which are already at sea, when you consider cost per container and a few extra days, it's really uh, a better business model to go south. So we don't see the container activity uh, uh, being, uh, being that active. Then of course fishing. As fish stocks migrate, fishing fleets will migrate, and how do you provide for that? How do you police that? Uh, how do you respond to problems that may exist uh, there? Now the other thing, uh, especially for the United States, is we do not have, for all intents and purposes, an ice-breaking fleet. We used to. Uh, we're down to two icebreakers right now. Uh, Russia has 43, uh, so there's a significant difference. Uh, if, if the Coast Guard and the government were to do their normal way of buying icebreakers, we couldn't afford to do it, in my opinion. They're about a billion dollars a piece, uh, at least. And what we're looking at and will likely be recommending are different means of acquiring them or leasing them. Uh, the Finns make great icebreakers. Why should we buy them when we can lease them? So those are some of the things um, that we're looking at. Uh, the other aspect of the Arctic is you have to know what's going on up there. And so the term that we're using is Arctic domain awareness. How do you know what's moving on uh, and over and under the sea? How can you respond collectively if there's an incident or an accident there? And so how do the countries and how do the nations that are using the Arctic share that information? What are the protocols that you use to work together and to respond? Um, the other aspect is communications. Communication systems, particularly the overhead, the satellites, are really optimized between 74 degrees north latitude and 74 degrees south latitude. When you're in the Arctic Circle, it's pretty spotty. So how are you going to communicate? And, and especially how are you going to communicate and the heavy bandwidth demand that we've all come to rely on over these last couple of years. What's the best way to do that? Um, towers, for example, that you may want to set in permafrost are going to be moving, so your alignment goes off. Those are the sorts of things that we have to deal with. I talked about incidents that can happen in the Arctic. Um, a search and rescue because of a ship that's been sunk, an environmental disaster that may have taken place. When we did the Deepwater Horizon, we had the entire oil and gas infrastructure in the Gulf of Mexico from which to base and mobilize. That doesn't exist in the Arctic. So how do you build that? And we're looking at making recommendations on public-private partnerships because quite frankly I'm not sure that uh, in a time of austerity you're going to be able to build those out. And so how do you build and construct that? The other aspect of the Arctic as well for us is governance. Uh, we have many agencies and many departments that are involved. And quite frankly, there's no one place that you can go and get a good view of what must be done, how are the decisions made, how do you make uh, budgetary decisions. And so uh, recommendations will follow on how we do that. I'm quite captured by the Norwegian model. I think Norway stands as the best example of how they've been able to pull their whole government and their private industry together to where they can quickly and effectively and efficiently make uh, business decisions, if you want to call them business decisions, on the part of a government. I think the other aspect that is going to be uh, significant for the United States is that all of the Arctic nations, and there are eight Arctic nations that comprise the Arctic Council, um, there are permanent observers, uh, the indigenous communities in the Arctic have permanent representation, uh, but one of the things that they've all agreed on, and we've agreed on as well, is that the governance of uh, the Arctic will be based on the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. The United States complies with that convention, but we're not party to that convention. And our friends say, we understand that you have some challenging politics when it comes to ratifying that treaty, but in two years' time, we become the chairman of the Arctic Council. And if I were a betting man, I'd put money on the fact that we will be challenged with respect to our authority and our legitimacy uh, when it comes time uh, for us to take over the Arctic Council in, which is just two, two short years away. So those are just some of the things that we're looking at, some of the recommendations that we're getting our head around. And it, it is our intention to be able to produce uh, some um, thoughts, some ideas, some recommendations, some suggestions 
uh, so that as we prepare to take over uh, the chairmanship of the Arctic Council, that we'll be able to shape um, the policies of the United States and the interaction that we have with all of the other countries, to be able to make recommendations with regard to policy, investments, and technology as the Arctic continues to open. Because in all of the forecasts, um, the ice isn't forecast to be coming back. Uh, I, I, I avoid getting into the, the emotional, the heated debates as to why the ice is going away. All I know is that the ice is going away, that the Arctic is changing, and we have to change and adapt and be prepared to use it responsibly, responsibly uh, safely, and in a way that assures the prosperity for, for all of the users. So with that, I will stop. I think I'm on 15 minutes. I didn't get gonged. Uh, and I'll take any questions that you have uh, on the Arctic or other things that I've been working on. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, thank you for uh, the talk. It was very informative. In terms of the resources that are out there, I know there's a couple of countries that are attempting to use international law to claim ownership on, uh, on those resources. Can you comment a little bit on the current status? What are the, uh, the tricks, uh, if you will, that the countries are trying to use to yeah. you know, say this is mine or this is yours? Yeah. Great. Thanks for the question, and it, and it kind of follows on the, one of the last points that I was making. It was about how are the countries laying claim to uh, the resources that are there and some of the tricks that may be being used. Um, I, I won't use the term trick because it's a quite uh, straightforward uh, method, and it's consistent with the Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, every country... Uh, every coastal country has a continental shelf that goes, uh, goes out. Uh, and it's defined with, it mathematically defined. Then there's something that's called the extended continental shelf. And that's the area that the countries are beginning to lay claim to. Um, using the definition within an UNCLOS for the extended continental shelf. Um, and a country will file its claim. Um, with uh, the seabed authority that is governed by the uh, Convention on Law of the Sea. And then that authority will rule on, on the boundaries. And it's really quite scientifically based. Um, in the case of the United States, uh, the size of the extended continental shelf for the United States, what we believe fits that mathematical parameter, is about twice the size of the Louisiana Purchase. So it's a huge amount of uh, land, uh, or bottom, I should say. Um, but we can't file because we're not party to the law of the sea convention. Uh, I've told some of the critics of, of, of uh, the law of the sea convention that the way I've described it for the United States, it's as if uh, the US, which has the largest potentially claimed extended continental shelf, is holding the Powerball lottery ticket, and we are refusing to cash it in. Um, it, to me, it's as simple as that. Very well defined, very clear process. Um, many of the countries have already submitted their claims, and it will take a couple of years for, the, for that to be adjudicated. But it's really quite clear and quite straightforward. And I think it's very unfortunate uh, that because of political uh, uh, sensitivities in the United States we haven't ratified. Yes, sir. So, um, what, I guess, is the rationale for people who don't want to ratify it, right? If we don't, is there a potential of us losing out on what they can define as our right under that? What, what are, what's the reason for hesitancy and what's the potential of, of, of losing out? Um, the claim that opponents put forth is that uh, we, we relinquish sovereignty. Uh, initially, the claim was dealing with the right of our military to operate uh, internationally in ways that we have for centuries. There is nothing in the convention, and in fact, the convention actually reinforces the way we operate. So there's nothing to that. About two years ago, there was an abrupt change on the part of the opponents, and they kind of put that aside and say, no, we're okay with that now. 
but now it deals with the royalty provision that's in UNCLOS. That even within the extended continental shelf, there is a royalty that is paid for production of resources that come off the bottom. It is um, relatively small. It doesn't begin until the sixth year of production. And then it only creeps up slightly to about 12%. Um, and it's only on production. It's not what people spend to go do the exploration, the extraction. Uh, but as I talked about that large bottom area where I think not only is there energy, but there are probably rare earth minerals on the bottom. Um, the United States currently has the best technology for seabed mining. So all of that comes into play. The companies that are the best in seabed mining, the U.S. companies, actually will front behind a foreign company because they're concerned about uh, liabilities under law of the sea. So there are multiple disadvantages uh, economically and I would even say technologically because the more we do things the more we tend to learn. So I think we're foregoing a lot of opportunities there and already funneling money off into, uh, into other coffers. Yes ma'am. Because um, I, I've been watching uh, some of the, uh, the status because uh, in Antarctic they actually have a tre um, uh, treatment 2014, uh, 2041. So that means until that year, there's no drilling or mining activities are allowed there. I wonder whether we have the same thing going on for Arctic because all of your presentation is based on the fact that it's going to be open and there's no human agreement saying that we should not do it. Right. And uh, the question is, in the Antarctic, there's a treaty that restricts uh, extraction to 2041, but in the, Antar in the Arctic, there isn't one. And the reason being is that the rules that govern uh, economic zones, extended uh, uh, continental shelves, um, is all governed by the law of the sea. So there is a treaty. Um, the, uh, the right of countries to uh, explore and exploit within their their legitimate claimed areas exists. Um, the regulatory regime is quite stringent. Uh, the I think it's Shell has invested over six billion dollars and they haven't even pulled one drop of energy out of the bottom because of the, the, the restrictions. That's within the United States. Canada, Norway, very strong uh, controls on that. I'm not as confident on the Russian side as I am on the U.S. side as far as the environmental protections, the environmental regulation, uh, and the discipline with which that extraction will occur. So the, I don't envision a treaty that will restrict activity because it's all governed by law of the sea. And then the Arctic nations, if there's one area on the planet where I think countries are working very cooperatively and very responsibly, it's in the Arctic. It's probably one of the most benign areas in the world right now. So, um, but, but one of the things that we want to do is really highlight the importance of responsibility and, and safety and security. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, they, um, Norway, um, it's a, I think it's a very well governed country. Um, I mean, my father in law has a sign in his driveway that says, you know, parking for Norwegians only. So maybe I have a little bias there. But um, the, uh, uh, the, I think that governmentally, and, and they have looked, you know, they've benefited from the work that's been done in the North Sea. As you may know, Norway is sitting on a huge uh, fund of money and they're going through some political uh, discussion now on how that will, will be. But I just think that the politics and the focus on responsible and safe development, uh, but at the same time being supportive of, uh, of that industry and, and being very uh, strict on enforcement of regulations, they have been pumping and exploring for years without um, uh, without any major incidents up there. It can be done. It's done very efficiently. It's just the way that their government is, is working. And I really believe that we could do the same. 
Um, there are times where I think it may be a f long way off, but, but I think they just have gotten into this. They value the resource that's coming in. They insist on it being done safely. Um, and it's a great partnership of the industry and the government and the NGOs that monitor the types of activity that are going on. Yes, sir. Thank you, Admiral, for speaking with us today. Um, you mentioned security is one of the aspects. Yeah. The, the Navy, uh, its membership and fleet brought down. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of priorities elsewhere. How do you see the Arctic mission being prioritized and is it capable right now to do <coughs> Yeah. Um, how do I see the Navy prioritizing the Arctic and do we have what we need and particularly as the fleet size draws down? I, you know, a lot of my Navy uh, brothers and sisters would be aghast when I say that to me that right now the Coast Guard is on point in the Arctic because it's about environmental uh, enforcement, it's about fisheries enforcement, it's about search and rescue. Um, and so I think the Coast Guard is in lead on that. The, the Navy w potentially will uh, follow, but clearly, apart from the icebreakers, the ships that are going to operate in the high north uh, need to be strengthened. They don't have to be icebreakers. Uh, but the systems within the ships need to be able to support operating in much lower temperatures. They need to be designed so you don't have as much ice accumulation where you have stability problems with the ship because they get heavier with all the ice that forms on top. Um, and, and so that was one of the reasons when we put together the Arctic Roadmap for the Navy was to begin to look at when do we have to start making the R&D investments, when do we have to start putting money into strengthening ships, changing ships, and perhaps building new classes of ships. But the, the urgency in my mind is really on the Coast Guard. Yes, sir. You spoke about the magnitude that we have due to Alaska, uh, the continental shelf, and extended continental shelf. I always heard that Russia and us, Russia even had more than us. Is that not true? And is there extended shelf? I remember them sending the submersible down with the flag and yeah. all that. And then my other question was about with the Antarctic. I was, I thought it was for scientific purposes only, but then the 2041 comment came up. Is there plans for extracting minerals after 2041? Yeah, uh, great question. One is the uh, size of ours versus the size of the Russian extended continental shelf and then Antarctica 2041. Um, the, we, we maintain that if, if, if uh, we conform to the, to the models for the extended continental shelf, we enjoy the largest, uh, largest continental shelf. And then Particularly if you look at our coastlines, we by far have um, huge extended continental shelves. So this is not just about the Arctic, this is about everywhere. Um, but the fact of the matter is the Russians did go down, they planted a, a flag on a, on a ridge that comes out. My sense is that that would all get adjudicated and I'm comfortable with that. I think you know, letting, uh, letting the models work and, and go from there. With regard to 2041 in the Antarctic, I've not heard of anyone talking about, you know, we need to get down there and that they're all salivating to do that. Um, that's a ways off. Um, but I guess one of my great concerns is that we're looking at energy coming out of the Ar Arctic and then if people want to pull to the Antarctic. And my great concern is that it's going to cause us to back off some of the other energy initiatives that I think are going to be so important, particularly in the renewable area. Um, you know, I've seen the movie before. Uh, I recall the gas lines that were probably a couple of decades before you were born um, and, you know, waiting in line for hours just to put a tank of gas in my car. Um, and everyone got really serious about energy. Well, that waned. Then I think we started to get serious again here recently with solar and wind. Um, and now, now there's this sense that you know, we're good on gas for maybe 100 years. And I think the great challenge that we have, and when I say we, it's not the United States, it's everyone, is how do we make sure that we don't back off on those longer term renewable sources of energy? Uh, that are going to be important to the planet for many, many reasons. That to me is the greatest challenge. So we hope to uh, in inject in that and by the way, I'm um, also involved in a National Academy of Science study on uh, what can we do to make sure that we're bringing that clean energy on 
in a, in a faster and more reliable way to where people can make uh, good, sound uh, decisions, policy and investment decisions on it. That's, sorry for the little sermon there, but I really do think that we cannot uh, let this drive toward renewables fade because we think we've you know, hit the mother load on, on uh, uh, fossil fuels. Yes, sir. Um, do you think that with the, uh, sort of the commercialization of the Arctic that we run the risk of setting up new, you know, stronger incentives for some of these companies to fight climate legislation, to fight renewable development, because they, you know, the, the more ice melt, basically, the more opportunities. So do you think that that could be a danger? Uh, do I think that because of the opening Arctic and easier access to resources that the companies will fight um, uh, some of the regu regulation or move toward uh, renewables? Um, I, uh, I've not seen that. Um, they, the, the work, for example, that Shell has been doing uh, up until last year has been extraordinary in my mind. Um, and unfortunately, they've packed up and they've gone to Russia. Um, I'm not sure it's because there's more energy there. It's just easier. So I think those are some of the things that, that we're going to have to watch. And that's why earlier I said that I'm comfortable with Norway, Canada, US. And if there's anyone from Russia in here, I apologize. But um, I'm not sure that I see that same level of uh, control responsibility uh, that's there. The other thing that's going to be happening, I think you'll see, and the Russians have started to do it, is to bring floating nuclear reactors and to power um, the, uh, some of their infrastructure. What are the safety standards? What are the rules that, by which they're operating? What are the environmental effects on, on those floating nuclear power plants? I've seen their naval nuclear power plants, and so I'm a little um, concerned about that. Yes, sir. Could you give us an idea of the cost of the ideas to actually bring the foil, the cost of the barrel? What do um, I think that's to be determined. Uh, as I said, Shell has invested $6 billion and they haven't pulled anything up yet. Um, and uh, so if you, if you add that to the first barrel that comes out, it's a pretty expensive barrel of oil. <laughs> so, anyway. Well, great. I didn't get gonged. I don't see any hands up. Uh, but thank you very much for your questions, because every time I get a question, it causes me to think a little bit more about some of the things that we're working on. Uh, it's extraordinarily interesting. It involves technology. It involves policy. It involves energy. It involves the welfare of human beings and involves the health uh, of our planet. So if there's one area that, uh, that I find continuous interest in, it's in the high north. And I have to admit, the only time I've been up there has been under the ice. And uh, I'll let you guess what that was on. So thanks. <laughs> OK, thank you.